Thank you, Senator Paul. What a beautiful group of young people here. Thanks for coming to uh, listen. I think I had been on the bench, oh, for about two weeks. You walk out in the courtroom, there's this many people in the courtroom at 8.30 in the morning. It's small claims. They each want their case tried before lunch because at 1.30 you have a crowd the same size. Typical cases, the dry cleaner ruined my dress, but he also tried to pick up my sister. <laughs> This so, old guy in the back says to me, Judge, my client doesn't speak English. We need a translator. What's the language? Italian. I call the courthouse administrator to get the Italian translator. She's busy in another courtroom. So I say to the throngs, is there anybody here that speaks Italian? Little guy in the back waiting for his own case raises his hand. He comes up. We, tra we swear this guy in to translate truthfully. We swear in the witness. And here's act actually literally what happened. Lawyer to translator, give the court your name. Translator to witness, what is it, your name? <laughs> Let me see where this is going to go. Ask your next question, lawyer to translator, give the court your address. Translator to witness, where is it, your house? <laughs> I looked at this character, I said, I thought you said you could speak Italian. He said, I can't hear around with my English, she's not a too good. <laughs> From uh, a ridiculous trial like that to a very serious trial. You may know these words from a very famous um, play and Oscar winning movie. Some men say the world is round and some men say it is flat. But if it is round, could the king's command flatten it? And if it is flat, could an act of parliament make it round? Now these words were uttered by Sir Thomas More presenting a summary of his defense before a jury. He was representing himself. The trial was for treason, the alleged act of treason and proven under the law was silence. His refusal to acknowledge that the king was the head of the church on earth as well as the head of the government. And for that, he was tried for treason. So why would he make an argument like that? Of course, the king can't flatten a round earth, and of course, parliament can't make a flat earth round. The jury understood that. But he was appealing not only to their common sense, but to their understanding of the laws of nature, what we call today the natural law, that there are certain functions that exist in the world that government, for all of its majesty and all of its power, and Henry VIII was the most powerful potentate known at the time, and the British parliament was very good at extracting wealth from nobles in order to give it to Henry. But he was making the argument that even government has restraints on it, no matter how powerful it is and what it wants to do. This argument of a natural order of things was not novel with Moore. This had been articulated by Aristotle, had been refined by Thomas Aquinas. It would be picked up by John Locke. It would be picked up by John Locke's most famous student, Thomas Jefferson. So when he wrote in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, he's making the argument that our rights come from our humanity. If you believe in God, if you believe in an all-knowing, all-loving all God the Father as I do, you believe that God gave us the greatest gift he could, which is perfect freedom, the freedom to do well and the freedom to do ill. If you don't believe in God, you can accept the argument that human beings are the highest and best rational creatures on the planet. And our natural yearnings to be free come from within us. So this argument about where do rights come from is reflective in the government even today. And of course, it would be at the core of the American Revolution. I'll just tell you a couple of stories about the American Revolution. You probably know this one. One of the most notorious, more notorious uh, pieces of legislation that the British government enacted was the Stamp Act. This applied only in the colonies. It wouldn't apply in Great Britain or there would have been a revolution there. This required that every colonist in the 13 colonies in North America have on every piece of paper in their possession, every book, every financial document, every letter, every pamphlet, even a poster to be nailed to a tree, the king's stamp. How would you get the king's stamp? You would go to a local British post office in the American colonies and buy this stamp. It wasn't a stamp as we know it now. It was painted on by stencil. Question, how did the king and the parliament 3,000 miles away know if you had 
the stamps on the documents in your house. Answer another abominable piece of legislation called the Writs of Assistance Act. See if this sounds familiar. The Writs of Assistance Act established a secret court that only heard the government and permitted British agents to go to the court and ask for what we lawyers call a general warrant. A general warrant does not name the person or place or thing to be searched or seized. It is a piece of paper that authorizes the bearer to search where he wishes and seize what he wants. So it wouldn't be uncommon for a colonist to hear a knock on the door and a very polite British soldier would show him or her the general warrant and then rummage through the house ostensibly looking for the stamps. They might also take alcohol if you couldn't have, uh, if you didn't have tax stamps on it. They might take furniture if they felt that the furniture had been imported from somewhere outside the uh, British Kingdom, the British Empire, and you hadn't paid uh, the king's tax. They might even take the house from you if they liked it and they needed a place to sleep, which is why I'm jumping ahead. Now we have the Third Amendment that prohibits quartering troops on private property against the wishes of the owner. Well, a couple of very enterprising students from what was then called the College of New Jersey, which is now known as Princeton, did a little math and concluded that it cost the king more to enforce the Stamp Act than was generated by, than was revenue generated by the sale of the stamps. Now that's a head scratcher. George III was an idiot, we all know that. But was he so stupid that he would lose money by enforcing the tax? Unless the purpose of the Stamp Act and the Writs of Assistance Act was not to generate money but to remind the colonists that the king was still the king and he could enter their homes at his will. He could cross their threshold by a general warrant issued by a secret court in London and he could do it in the person of his agents and soldiers here in America. This, of course, really turned the tide of public opinion, not overwhelmingly, but substantially towards revolution to the extent that we're able to gauge public opinion in 1766 10 years before the revolution. It's about one third in favor of seceding from Great Britain. It's about one third staying where we are. It's about one third undecided. But imagine being undecided over something like that, but that's the, the, what the historiography tells us. Well, we all know what happened. We fought a revolution. We won the revolution. We wrote a constitution. The purpose of the constitution is to assure that there are restraints on the government so the new government would not do to us here, our own government, what the king and the parliament did to the colonists. The constitution is ratified only with the promise of a bill of rights. So within a year and a half of the ratification of the constitution comes the ratification of the first 10 amendments. Madison, who wrote the constitution, he was the scrivener in 1787 when they met in secret in Philadelphia was also the chair of the House of Representatives Committee that drafted the Bill of Rights. Imagine this guy. He wrote the Constitution and he wrote the Bill of Rights. Guess what he also wrote? He was one of those students at the College of New Jersey who had done the calculation proving that the Stamp Act was a fraud because it was costing them more to enforce it than they were actually uh, collecting. But the Bill of Rights doesn't grant liberty, it keeps the government from interfering with liberty. You all know this phrase from the First Amendment. Now this is a trick question that constitutional law professors ask their students on day one. I'm gonna give you another trick question in a couple of minutes. What's the most important word in the following phrase? Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Opening lines of the First Amendment. I'll repeat the phrase. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Why is it a trick question? Because the, the most important word is the one you would think is the least important, the. By referring to it as the freedom of speech, an argument Madison had about whether this word was going to be in there, it reflected the belief of the founders that the freedom of speech preexisted the government. It doesn't say Congress shall grant freedom of speech 
It says Congress may not interfere with the freedom of speech. Well, if it doesn't come from Congress, freedom of speech, if it doesn't come from the government, freedom of speech, where does it come from? Back to Jefferson's argument, our rights are inalienable and they're gifts from God. It comes from our humanity. So all of those rights articulated in the First Amendment are what we call negative rights. They negate the ability of the government to interfere with rights that pre-exist the government. If I could go through all the rights, it would take a long time to go through them, but you know what they are. Your right to speak, as, to think as you wish, to speak as you think, to publish your words, your right to worship or not, not to worship, your right to associate or not to associate, your right to self-defense, which Justice Scalia has written in Heller versus the District of Columbia, is the individual and personal right to keep and bear arms of the same technical capacity as the government because they wrote the Second Amendment not to preserve the right to shoot deer, but to preserve the right to shoot at the government if it becomes taken over by a tyrant. Very, very interesting line in that opinion because the dissenters said, okay, they were talking about muskets, so we'll, we'll go along with you can carry muskets in 2008, the year of the opinion. Scalia said, oh no. They were talking about whatever their adversaries had, which would be the king's soldiers or an evil person breaking into your house. Imagine defending yourself against an army of tyrants or against a, a thief in the night using a musket. It would obviously be uh, fruitless. Back to the Bill of Rights. Your right to possess your own property and to keep the government out of it, no matter how desperate the soldiers need for it. And the great right in the Fourth Amendment, the quintessentially American right, the right to be left alone. Fourth Amendment, the right to privacy, the right to keep the government out of your persons, houses, papers, and effects. When uh, President Obama was uh, president, I often started my comments by saying, I want everybody to take their iPhone, Android, Blackberry, whoever still uses a Blackberry, and turn it on because I want Barack Obama to hear everything I'm about to say. Now that, of course, normally doesn't even arouse laughter today because, as you know, you can't turn this off. It may look like it's off, but it's not off. It is still a GPS if the government wants to hack into it, and it is still a recording device if the government wants to activate its ability uh, to do so. When Edward Snowden uh, met with a journalist to whom he was revealing the gross violations of the Constitution, perpetrated by the NSA, he collected everybody's uh, iPhone and put them in a refrigerator because he knew from his training in the dark arts that one cannot hack through the wall of a refrigerator. So if you remember anything from my talk today, remember that. <laughs> Want to keep the government from activating this? Put it in a refrigerator. Of course, we live in an era today where the government doesn't recognize the rights that the Constitution says the government shall not interfere with, but it was not always that way. You know, in the early part of the country, when George Washington was president and John Adams uh, was vice president, it was fairly peaceful in that era, and then John Adams became president and Thomas Jefferson became vice president, and they didn't speak to each other. Well, why didn't they speak to each other? Do you remember how people got elected in those days? Everybody ran for president. Whoever finished first, became president. Whoever finished second became vice president. Oh my, Hillary, can you cover this funeral for me today? <laughs> and of course, there was great bitterness between them. But during the presidency of John Adams, there developed a fear in the country, which is not a fear, not a rational fear that we would have today. It was fear of the French. All right, the French had just cut off the head of Louis XVI. Jefferson was close to a lot of those French aristocrats from his years there as the U.S. ambassador to France. They were worried that the French would come here and foment some kind of a revolution against John Adams, of all people. So in order to prevent that, the government enacted the Alien and Sedition Acts, which basically said, if you want to come to the United States, come. We'll give you five acres of land. You work the land for six months. You're automatically a citizen. Unless you're French, you have to work the land for 14 years before you can become a citizen. And by the way, not just you newcomers, but everybody else here. Whoever shall bring the president 
or the government or the Congress into disrepute by uttering a falsehood about them shall be guilty of a felony punishable by two years in jail. Oh, well, this is a head scratcher. How could the same generation, in some cases the same human beings that had just written, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech, enact a statute that abridged the freedom of speech, that punished speech? By the way, who's missing in that list? Government, Congress, President, courts, the Vice President. They didn't want to protect Jefferson, and he didn't want their protection to begin with. So there was a member of Congress uh, from Vermont, Congressman Matthew Lyons, sort of an early day Ron Paul, who decided to challenge the Alien and Sedition Acts. And in order to do that, he decided to confront the progenitor of the Alien and Sedition Acts, President Adams. Now, Adams suffered from uh, an affliction that uh, unfortunately is visited upon a lot of middle-aged men, an ever-expanding waistline. And in order to cover the waistline, Mrs. Adams prepared a purple robe for her husband, the president, to wear. And she didn't like the way the purple looked, so she put gold epaulets on the corner, on the shoulders. So it would not be uncommon to see this short, fat, purple-robed, gold-emblazoned, long-white-haired character walking into the Capitol building, and he was the President of the United States. Congressman Lyons didn't like this show of, uh, of self-aggrandizement. So he approached him one morning and said, good morning, your pomposity. And Adams just sort of brushed him off. Next time he brought the press there and said, good morning, your rotundity. And for that, Congressman Lyons was indicted and prosecuted for violating the Alien and Sedition Act. Everybody thought it was a joke. It wasn't a joke. He was convicted. And he spent two years in a basement dungeon in western uh, Massachusetts. And then he did something which, if you are from Chicago, New Orleans, Boston, or Hudson County, New Jersey, you are familiar with what he did. He ran for re-election from his jail cell. And he won. And of course, he couldn't wait to get back to the Capitol building to confront his pomposity and his rotundity, when to his great surprise, instead of the short, fat, rotund John Adams wearing a purple robe with gold epaulets, was the tall, thin, raven-haired friend of liberty, Thomas Jefferson, who proceeded to pardon Congressman Lyons and return the 460 acres of land that the federal government had seized from him. The Alien and Sedition Act died of its own weight because the party that put it into play, the Federalists, were voted out of power when Jefferson became president. They were worried that Jefferson's people, the Anti-Federalists, would use the Alien and Sedition Act against them. So the last day of the Federalist Congress, which was the same day that John Marshall was confirmed as Chief Justice, the Alien and Sedition Act was repealed. Jefferson then proceeded to pardon not only Congressman Lyons, but everybody else who had been convicted under the, uh, under the Alien and Sedition Act. One more story, and then we'll try and draw some conclusions from all this. It's the War of 1812. You know, we don't even know what the War of 1812 was about. One theory is the British tried to take back the colonies. Another theory is we tried to take Canada from the king. Whatever the theory is, the following is true. A platoon of 50 soldiers is marching through Upper Marlboro, Maryland one night, and they capture five townsfolk and threaten to hang them in the morning if the militia doesn't surrender. The militia invades the British encampment and captures five British soldiers and threatens to hang them at, uh, at sunrise if they don't return the townsfolk. Well, it's a sort of an impasse. The, the militia had the same weaponry. They actually had better weaponry than the British did because we had, you must know this, the Kentucky long gun, which fired its bullets twice the distance of the guns that the king's armorers made for his soldiers. Now, it doesn't take a war to go on too long to decide which side is going to win. Nevertheless, we have this impasse in Upper Marlboro, Maryland, and John Hodges, as the mayor, decides, I gotta end this. He walks 
unaccompanied, in the middle of the night, into the middle of the British encampment, finds the captain and says, we got to make a deal. You return our five people, we'll return yours. The captain shakes hands, the hostages are returned, the British encampment leaves. Six months later, the War of 1812, after the White House and the Capitol building had been burnt, the War of 1812 is over. There's an enormous display of patriotism and, and joy in Upper Marlboro, Maryland. Mayor Hodges is the Grand Marshal of the parade. He's introduced by a local federal judge. Everybody in government is there saluting him and congratulating him that we saved all these lives, the British left. I hope what happened to him does not happen to me when I finish giving this talk because he stepped down from the podium and two strangers approached him. One put shackles on his wrists and the other handed him a piece of paper. The piece of paper was an indictment from the Justice Department. He was indicted for treason, providing aid and comfort to the enemy in wartime by returning the enemy soldiers. Well, that's another head scratcher. So there's a trial. John Hodges is tried for treason. The judge at the trial is the one that introduced him at the end of the parade. All the jurors had participated in the parade. The prosecutors had participated in the parade. Government stands up and says, look, we don't even want to try this case, but we are forced to by the Justice Department in Washington because the definition of treason in the Constitution is providing aid and comfort to the enemy in wartime. Defense stands up and said, we don't really need to present a defense. Everybody knows what he did. He's a local hero. He saved innocent human life. He arguably triggered the end of the war. And then the judge says to the jury, there were no ladies on the jury in those days, I wish there had been, gentlemen of the jury, I can't imagine saying this, when we finish here, we want you to go across the street to a local, the, the local tavern where the innkeeper has a barrel of his finest ale. And after you finish consuming the ale, we want you to begin deliberating. This, of course, would be unheard of today. You can't even bring Red Bull into a jury room today. Foreman stands up and says, we, we already know the outcome, Your Honor. You know the outcome? Have you been deliberating? No, but we already know the outcome. What's the outcome? The mayor is not guilty. This is the first historic example in history of jury <coughs> nullification of a bunch of farmers saying to the federal government, stay the hell out of here and leave us alone. Now, there's a little bit of a dark side to this. Here's the dark side. Because treason is the one crime for which one can be executed even if you didn't cause the death of another. The Justice Department regulations, when they're followed, requires that the president personally authorize the prosecution for treason. What left-wing pinko big government creep was the president of the United States in 1812? James Madison, who wrote the Constitution and wrote the Declaration of Independence. Okay, so now some questions. Why is it that people on the outside of government looking in are so different from when they are on the inside looking out? How could the great defender of our freedom, James Madison, who argued that our rights come from our humanity and not from the government, have permitted this prosecution? How could George Washington and that generation, which risked their lives, fortunes, and sacred honors to protect our natural rights, have permitted prosecutions for speech? Well, we could, we could split philosophical hairs all afternoon, but I'll suggest a couple of uh, theories to you. One is that we all have original sin. We all have the lust and the urge to dominate others. And sometimes that lust and urge, when presented to us on a platter, like being in the government, is just too attractive to resist. <clears throat> there aren't many people like Rand Paul in the government. There are some, I could name some names, but you probably know who they are, who resist the temptation to tell others how to live. But it's common today, all across the government, that the government can right any wrong and regulate any, beha any behavior and tax any event because, just because they have the power to do it. 
St. Augustine called this libido dominandi. Not that other kind of libido, but the lust, <laughs> the lust to dominate. The other and a little bit more controversial idea about why this happens is because in government there's a bit of make-believe. Make-believe the king is divine. Make-believe he can do no wrong. Make-believe the voice of the people is the voice of God. Make-believe that the people have a voice. Make-believe that the government works for the people. Make-believe that the government cares about the people. Make-believe that all men are created equal. Make-believe that they're not. Fostering these myths about government, people more generally will accept its excesses. People like Senator Paul, my good friends Thomas Massey and Justin Amash in the House of Representatives, my other good friend uh, in the Senate, uh, Mike Lee, are constantly on guard against the mythology of government. And they are constantly on guard of keeping a government confined as Jefferson said, chained down to the Constitution. All right, look, this is not all gloom and doom. You have to have a sense of humor. So I'm in my office one day, and uh, this is two or three years ago. The phone rings. Like most of your phones, the screen tells you who's calling. It's my colleague, John Stossel. His office is two doors from mine. Why is he calling? Johnny, what is it? It's Judge, I've got to go on O'Reilly's show tonight, and I don't want to go. Can you take my place? I said, well, look, without even asking you, why you don't want to go and what the subject matter is. Of course, I can't take your place. What are you, crazy? I have enough problems with Fox management and with O'Reilly. I can't just show, show up at a show and say, I'm here instead of Stossel. They'll kick both of us out. But, but I'm curious, why don't you want to go? Well, because the subject matter is drones, and you're the expert on drones, and I'm just a consumer reporter. What do I know about drones? Johnny, would you mind if I sent you some things to read about drones? I'm, I'm capturing the links while we're talking. I sent him some things to read about drones. He calls me back, says, okay, I understand. Drones kill people. <laughs> and they kill people without due process. And they kill people without a declaration of war. And President Obama has used drones to kill Americans in foreign lands. I get this. I get this. The Constitution protects life, liberty, and property. The Constitution says, only the Congress can declare war. How could the president declare war on a person? Or John, these are all great arguments. I know, Judge, but I don't want to do it. Something crazy is going to happen. Would you please take my place? Johnny, I love you. We went to college together. I love you for 40 years. I can't do this. I go home, I go to bed. Who the heck's going to stay up and watch O'Reilly? I come in. <laughs> I come in the next day, and I say, we find Johnny. What the hell happened? He said, you're not going to believe it. I went down to the studio. No O'Reilly. What do you mean, no O'Reilly? What was there? Well, the crew was there. The camera was there. They didn't tell me this. He's such a sneak. O'Reilly was in a television studio in Los Angeles with 2,000 people in the audience. As soon as I sat down in our little studio in New York, this is Stossel speaking, my face shows up on a flat screen eight or nine times normal human size, and I hear O'Reilly start. All right, Stossel, what's wrong with drones? They kill the bad people, they save the good people. At the time, we didn't even know that any of this is going on. Right, Bill, but the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and it protects life, liberty, and property. And if the government wants life, liberty, and property, it has to follow due process unless there's been a declaration of war and the president can't declare war, only the Congress can. And if that is not upheld, Bill O'Reilly, the drones could come after you. I thought that was a pretty good argument. At that point, at that point, O'Reilly said, wait a minute, Stossel, did you get these arguments from Judge Napolitano? <laughs> Stossel goes, well, well, as a matter of fact, I did. O'Reilly, big deal. He's not on the Supreme Court. The best he can do is Fox and Friends. <laughs> so when Stossel told this to me, I didn't believe it. I said to my producer, get the computer clip of this tape of the show last night. I can't believe what happened there. Gives it to me. I watch it. It's exactly as he described it. I sent it to the boss, now deceased, Roger Ailes. I said, Roger, look at what they did to me last night. I said, let me watch it. Let me watch it. Calls me back a couple minutes later. He's laughing as you know what off. He goes, this is the funniest I've ever seen, O'Reilly. It's hilarious, and it's good publicity for you, so shut up. <laughs>
Even my hero, Thomas More, had a uh, sense of humor. Of course, he, he lost that case. He was convicted of treason and he was beheaded. The axeman was never told who the defendant was until the last minute. And when Moore approached the uh, scaffold and the axeman recognized his face, he was the most famous person in England and maybe in Europe at the time, the axeman began to weep. So he says to the axeman, well, look, don't, don't weep because you're going to send me to a very good place. But I'll tell you what, I need some help. What help could you possibly need? I'm an old man. I need some help up the scaffold but I don't think I'll need any help on the way down. <laughs> of course, Judeo-Christian teaching is that a sense of humor at the moment of certain death is a sign of, of sanctity, a belief, a certain belief uh, in the afterlife. So I make these arguments to you. I hope they're not novel. I hope you're generally familiar with these arguments. Our rights come from our humanity, and the purpose of the Constitution is not only to establish the government, but to restrain it. The Constitution establishes three separate branches of government. The Congress writes the laws, the President enforces the laws, the judiciary interprets the laws, the Congress declares war, the President wages war, the judiciary decides if either of the other two are exceeding their powers under the Constitution. They can't exchange the powers because the whole purpose of separating power is to maintain human freedom by keeping jealousy amongst the branches of government. Also part of little Jimmy Madison's genius. They call him little Jimmy because he was four foot eight. I would love to stand next to little Jimmy because I'd look like Shaquille O'Neal standing next to him. 